I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to the boardroom. In this video, I'm going to make this neat blanket chest. I dig through my super secret stash of cherry lumber and select a few four quarter boards and a six quarter board for the legs. As we're getting started, I'd like to mention if this is a project you'd like to build, I'll be selling plans on my website. Check the video description for more information. I head over to the bandsaw to break parts down into rough sizes. Then I move to the joiner and planer to get parts closer to final size. I leave them a 16th inch or so over and I leave them for a day or two to rest. Then I joint and plane one more time down to final size. Next, I clean up the inside edges with my double taper sanding disc. After deciding on the height, I cut the legs to length. This is me deciding on just one mullion versus two. Two looked too crowded. Next, I head over to my latest toy, I mean tool. This is a sliding table shaper. It's made by Felder and it's totally awesome. This is a replacement and I consider an upgrade for my router table. With that said, everything shown in this video could be done on a router table. It would just be a little slower cutting. I'm cutting a groove on the inside edge of all frame pieces. The first cut is very shallow to prevent tear out. I flip and cut from both top and bottom so the groove is centered. I make a fence adjustment and repeat the process to cut the groove to full depth. Next, I mark for some mortises. The groove is a half inch deep. The mortises will be cut down to just over one inch deep. I was watching something on YouTube and then YouTube suggested one of my videos. So yeah, I watched it. By the way, this is the key to upping your view count. Just play your own videos over and over. Same as with the groove, I'm referencing both sides and cutting to keep the mortise centered. I use the walls of the groove to set up the mortiser. Adding the mortises really isn't needed. This would be plenty strong enough with just a stub tenon fitted to the groove, but anything worth doing is worth overdoing, so I add the mortises. Next up, I cut the tenons back to the shaper for this operation. This really is one of the reasons for adding a shaper to the shop. A sliding table makes working on the end of a workpiece super easy. This could be done on the table saw, of course, but then I wouldn't have a reason to use my new toy. This cut is known as a haunch, which sounds like the nickname of the big guy on the football team in high school. The table saw makes quick work of this tedious task. At this point, the outer frame is ready to go. Now I need to cut and fit the center mullions. These just have the half inch stub tenon. I cut them to length as close as possible, knowing they're a tiny, tiny bit short. Then I use the fence on the shaper to sneak up on the shoulder to shoulder length. This is the critical length when putting all of this together. If the tenons don't totally bottom out in the groove, that's not gonna affect anything. I like to chamfer the tenon edges to make assembly a little easier. I mill up some more lumber for the center panels. This is always a fun exercise, trying to find the best way to glue boards together. There's never a right answer, but often there's a better answer. I 
After the glue is cured overnight, I run the panels through the white belt sander to clean them up. Measuring a distance from groove bottom to groove bottom can be tricky. Here's one way to get a good measurement. I make a mark on two sticks, then I pull the sticks out and take a measurement. With my accurately measured measurement, I cut the panels to size. I think it's a good idea to check off cuts to see if there's any cracks or checks. If the off cut breaks too easy, I'll take a look at the panel and see what I can see. And if I find a crack, I'll pour a little thin CA glue in there to strengthen it. Here I'm adding a rabbet to the back of the panels. This cut leaves a 3 8 inch thick tongue to fit into the groove, but it leaves the bulk of the panel at 5 8 of an inch to keep a nice hefty feel. A number 20 biscuit will cut too deep and it would interfere with the mortise and tenon, so I switched to a number 0 biscuit. These biscuits will help align the legs to the panels during glue up. No additional joinery is needed for strength. The biscuits are there just to keep things aligned during the giant cluster fornication that is the glue up. This is a long grain to long grain joint, so it's as strong or stronger than the wood itself. Once the biscuit slots were cut, I clamped everything together dry just to see where I was at. Not too bad. I start the glue up with the panels. When doing this, I try to put the right amount of glue on, which I would describe as a goodly amount, but not so much that there's lots of squeeze out. I use a putty knife to make sure the reveals are consistent all the way around. Then I use a couple of 23 gauge pins to keep the panels in place. I put these nails towards the center to allow some seasonal movement. Before clamping the legs to the panels, I clean them up with a double taper sanding disc, of course. I'm taking the smallest cut humanly possible, hardly enough to even measure, just trying to remove the pencil marks, really. Next, I use a marking gauge to score a line on the leg that's thinner than the panel by just a little bit. This will show me where to put glue, and more importantly, where not to put glue. It will also slightly help to prevent squeeze out. This is an area where a big mess can be created. Again, I'm working pretty hard here to get just the right amount of glue on the surface. Too much and squeeze out will ruin my day. Too little and the joint isn't gonna be strong enough. We can now call it a chest, not just a bunch of parts. While in the clamps, I decided to add a ledger to the bottom edge. This will hold up the plywood and aromatic cedar bottom. Speaking of bottom, I'm using some scrap plywood. I have this undersized by an eighth inch so I can rack the chest slightly if it was glued up out of square. This lumber is known as aromatic cedar, which I think is actually a type of juniper tree. It's slow growing, so boards are normally small and have a lot of knots, but it smells nice when it's kept inside of a chest. It's also said to keep away moths that eat wool. I don't know if I believe that, but it does smell nice inside of a chest, so here we go. Since the boards were naughty, and that's knot holes, not that they won't get Christmas gifts, I decided to make a grate. This would allow me to cut around a lot of the defects. It would also add more surface area for the wood to release its lovely smell. Mm -hmm. 
After milling the parts to size, I added a little round over because I was thinking fabric would get hung up on a sharp corner. I really didn't want to make a grate that wouldn't fit into my newly built chest, so I spent way too much time making sure the first couple pieces went together nice and square. I tried to mill up the slats so there would be a 1 8 inch gap between each one, but that didn't turn out quite perfect. So I ended up adding a couple layers of tape to some old 1 8 inch thick Kumiko pieces I had laying around. This wacky process of spacers, nail, and glue ended up working pretty well, and the end results looked really nice when installed in the chest. The last component to be built is the top. After digging through my supply, I wasn't able to find a combination that would allow me just three boards for the top. First of all, one giant board would be first choice, but a 20 inch wide cherry board is as rare as kyber crystals these days. Two would have been really nice. Three was doable, but I didn't want to use some of my nicer boards on this project. I have some future projects those are reserved for. So four boards it is. When milling these boards, I like to keep them even in size if possible. So I flip them back and forth and cut away a little off each until I have the sizes I need. I'm looking for sapwood defects, grain pattern when making these cuts. I think it would not have looked as good had I left three boards full width and then glued a little sliver on one side. For this type of project, I really like these torsion hinges. They hold the lid open and prevent the lid from slamming shut. Think the only place to get these is at Rockler, and I'd like to note they are not a sponsor. This is a Freud hinge mortising bit. Uh, these hinges are designed to work with 3 quarter inch thick material, but because I'm hardcore, these panels are 7 eighths of an inch thick, so some routing needs to be done. So this first jig is used to cut a space for the hinge to sit in when the lid is closed and have the lid flush with the top of the chest. Hope that makes sense. This second cut effectively reduces the thickness of the material down to three quarters of an inch. Yes, that is double-sided tape holding the jig in place. Let's take a closer look at the two jigs I used. Quick and dirty, which would make a good name for a ska band. Also note, uh, these aren't cut to super high tolerances. I get them close and make sure there's a little wiggle room. Couple nails and some glue for this one. When making these jigs, I use the actual hinge to size them. This is a Vix bit, which is a self-centering drill bit designed for installing hinges like to add a little wax to the screws just to help them cut the threads as they're going in for the first time. To locate the corresponding holes on the lid, I set the lid in place and mark the screw locations directly from the hinges. This may seem like a potential pitfall, but it works great if marks are made carefully. I transfer those marks around to the underside and use this jig Rockler cells to lay out the holes. I've pushed the jig an additional eighth of an inch in from the edge because I wanted a little more hangover, which winds up being about an inch and a quarter.
I knew this back corner was going to prevent the lid from closing, but I didn't know how to deal with it until I had the problem in front of me. So I just added a chamfer until the lid closed. Problem solved. People get really wrapped around the axle when it comes to seasonal wood movement. Uh, for this width of top, I just like to oval out the holes a little. This will be plenty of room for movement. I will admit, I could have done that a little straighter. These battens were made from extra legs that I milled up, hence their size. I cut and installed them so there's 1 8 inch clearance front and back. I don't know what it is, but adding a small bevel to the underside of a top really helps. I can't even describe why or what is made better when doing that, but to my eye, it just looks better. Could have cut these a bunch of different ways, but I figured hand planes would be fun. This may sound a little OCD, but when I'm taking these long, heavy cuts, I like to clear the shavings out after each pass. I do this so I can watch the next shaving as it's being cut. This helps me know if I'm keeping the plane at a consistent angle and taking a proper cut. I round over the top edge and sand everything up to 320 grit. The finish I'm using is Osmo. I don't know why, but I really like the way Cherry looks after applying Osmo. It adds just the right color to my eye. I apply two coats using the smear on, buff off method. How about a song recommendation before this video expires? Since I mentioned ska music earlier, how about the song Super Rad by the Aquabats? That's a fun, upbeat song for sure. I would also like to thank ska music in general for being the only form of music that properly utilizes the functionality of a trombone. One more final detail. I added some felt pads to the underside of the top. I didn't want this to clank when closing the lid or sitting on it. Also, just a quick reminder, if you'd like to build one of these for yourself, plans are available for sale on my website. I install the cedar grate for the final time and put a fork in this one because it's done. I like the way this turned out. I know everyone has their opinions, but cherry is such a nice looking wood to me. Not too light, not too dark, and a pleasure to work with. This is a simple project, but will function nicely and sit quietly in my boudoir. Since I'm getting old, I need a place to sit and put my pants on in the morning. I'll spare you the horror of that demonstration and instead will prove that this piece functions nicely by removing and reinstalling a shoe. Thank you for watching. Till next time.